with it in the future. So what we do in this paper is that we construct a macroeconomic epidemiological agent-based model that is an agent-based model which incorporates both a macroeconomic dimension and an epidemiological dimension which mutually feed back onto each other. We use this to investigate the economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, specifically in the Lombardy region of Italy, which uh, was the well, which is the region which has been arguably hardest hit by the pandemic in Italy and also the one where in, in fact it first broke out. Um, we use this model to conduct a, also to conduct a range of experiments to evaluate policies which are designed to uh, alleviate the economic fallout, the, 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 the downturns that are caused by both the pandemic and any uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions such as lockdowns that the epidemic might give rise to. And in terms of literature, I am fortunate in that last month Herbert presented uh, a paper which in, many ways, which in many ways is very similar to ours. And he gave an excellent overview over the existing literature, uh, macroeconomic literature on COVID-19. So I am going to keep this very brief. Uh, I just want to say that there is already a fairly sizable macroeconomic literature on, on COVID-19, especially so from the sort of more conventional side of things. So, you, you know, you, you will find papers which you have a sort of classic epidemiological SIR model running alongside an RBC model. You have a range of papers that look at um, optimal policy interventions to, uh, to, contain the, uh, to, to contain the pandemic. And uh, if, if we look specifically at the agent-based literature, however, there isn't, there isn't quite as much. Uh, the ones that I would highlight here are, of course, uh, the paper by Herbert that we heard about uh, that we heard about a month ago, which is, um, in terms of the approach, probably the closest to our work. There's also a paper by Patrick Mellacher, which incorporates a very, very detailed uh, epidemiological side and a much more simplified economic framework. And then I would also mention the uh, agent-based model by Sebastian Poletna and his co-authors, which they have applied to uh, an evaluation of the economic fallout of the pandemic. And yeah, as I hinted, the paper by, by uh, the B group from, Biele from Bielefeld is in fact, to our knowledge to date, the only other fully fledged macroepidemiological ABN. Now, why would we use an agent-based model to look at the impacts of the pandemic? In my view, uh, an agent-based methodology in this context offers a number of advantages. The first one, as we saw a month ago and as we are going to see today again, is that the agent-based methodology gives us a lot of possibilities to closely link the epidemic and the epidemiological dynamics to the economic side of the model. Obviously, an agent-based methodology also gives us a lot of freedom to model relevant aspects of population heterogeneity. And more broadly, it also allows us to model any kind of institutional detail we might wish to include, of course, within the constraints of the available computational resources. But in general, yes, uh, an agent-based model allows us to make very realistic and very detailed depictions, both of the base setting in terms of connections between agents, interactions between agents and so forth, but also uh, in terms of both pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical interventions that might be applied to, uh, contain the, to contain the epidemic. And finally, of course, an ABM gives us the possibility to analyze the, uh, the economic and epidemiological impacts, both at a micro and at a macro level. Now, 
one slide for a tiny bit of self-promotion. I would say another very interesting uh, strand of the literature related to COVID is the one that applies input-output models, uh, including dynamic input-output models, because this gives us uh, the possibility to gauge the impact of lockdowns at a sectoral and possibly regional level in a sort of a very data-driven framework, which at the same time from a computational perspective and in terms of the uh, underlying behavioral assumption is somewhat more parsimonious than a typical macroeconomic ABM. Um, and there's also some existing work in this regard, uh, including one paper that we heard about already in this series, uh, which was presented by Marco Pangallo and also uh, one that was recently published uh, by myself along with uh, a number of co-authors from places like Sant'Anna in Pisa and uh, Irpet in Florence. So in terms of uh, the model that Domenico and I use in this paper, what we do is we start, or well, the model that we use is essentially an extension of the baseline CATS macroeconomic agent-based model, which is the one from the 2015 paper by Asensa and co-authors in the JDC. And in our version of the paper, there are uh, four economic sectors namely a household sector, a banking sector, a public sector, and a firm sector, which is further subdivided into capital goods firms and consumption goods firms. And as you can see, the consumption goods firms are also themselves subdivided uh, into two subsectors, which we introduced specifically for this application. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. And on this diagram, you can also see that uh, these sectors interact on a uh, interact with, with each other on a range of markets, such as consumption goods, uh, market, labor market, capital goods market, and so forth. Now, the baseline CATS model is, is a fairly well-known framework. It's, it's, I would say, one of the handful of well-established macroeconomic ABMs. And among those, probably, uh, let's say, the most parsimonious in, in terms of its structure and its, its behavioral assumptions. So I'm going to try to give a very brief overview of uh, the baseline model and then talk about the extensions that we introduced specifically uh, for this paper. So in the CATS model, we have worker households, which inelastically supply one unit of labor to the labor market. They consume and they save in the form of deposits with the banking sector. Then there are, only, uh, then there are also uh, firm owner households, which receive dividends from both the banking sector and the firm sector. They also consume and they save in the form of deposits. There are capital goods firms and consumption goods firms, which produce or pr uh, make, make a quantity and a price decision based on an adaptive heuristic, which uh, essentially is based on, their on the assessment of their own price relative to, the rel uh, uh, relative to the average market price, as well as whether they have in the past experienced excess demand or excess supply. And these firms possibly demand loans from the banking sector to both finance production, and in the case of C firms, they also may demand loans to uh, invest in capital goods, which they buy from the K firms. There's a single representative bank, if you want, in the model, which takes deposits from the household sector and makes loans to firms. And this bank also buys government bonds. Then there's a government, which in our case, takes taxes, both profits and labor income, and it spends on benefit uh, on, on benefit payments, as well as on maintaining a healthcare sector that I'm going to talk about below. And all the markets in, in this model, the goods and labor markets are based on a very simple search and matching mechanism uh, that I'm going to describe in more detail when I come to the extensions that we introduce for this paper. So what, what are the modifications that we make? The, First big modification is that instead of having a quarterly model as in the baseline CATS model, this, mod, uh, the, this version runs at, a, runs at a monthly frequency, meaning one period of, in the economic model is supposed to represent one month. This is done, well, mainly because 
to capture the impact of things like lockdowns and so forth, you need uh, a model that runs at a higher frequency than, than a quarter because in fact, the lockdown in Italy itself, the lockdown during spring lasted about a quarter. So to get a detailed dynamic picture uh, of the economic impacts of the pandemic, we felt that it was necessary to go to a higher frequency whilst at the same time, of course, facing the trade-off that uh, a higher frequency to, sim to simulate a given time span, a higher frequency means a higher computational burden. So we settled for the economic model on a monthly frequency. Then the next uh, extension or modification that we make is that within the consumption goods sector, we distinguish between luxury and basic consumption goods or, or firms that produce luxury goods and firms that produce basic consumption goods. Uh, there is a fixed number of both in this model, uh, and you know they 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 can't they can't switch between sectors. And if a consumption goods uh, if a basic goods firm goes bankrupt, it is it is replaced by another basic goods firm. So number of both types of firms are constant over time, and consumers allocate their consumption their overall consumption between basic and luxury goods according to a type of lexicographic consumption behavior, meaning that in principle, they want to spend a share of a certain share of their income on the one and the other, with that share being determined by the relative price of basic and luxury goods. However, if a consumer doesn't have sufficient liquidity to finance their entire desired consumption, they will first consume basic goods and then spend the rest of their available liquidity uh, on luxury goods. The next extension is that we have an age structure among household agents in the model. So we have a sort of a, a, a very rough distinction with uh, three age groups, namely young, middle-aged and old, where old coincides with retired. And uh, the distinction between young and middle-aged in fact only feeds into the uh, epidemiological side of the model. Apart from that, young and middle-aged agents are equivalent, they both, they both work and consume in the same way. Whereas old, as I mentioned, old agents coincide with the inactive population in our model. Meaning that every old person is retired and is therefore not active on the labor market and instead of receiving a wage income receives a pension from the state. There is in the model now a government financed healthcare sector. And this is modeled in a very simple fashion. Namely, we assume that in every period, the government buys a certain fixed share of the output of all firms in the model. And we assume that this somehow feeds into a production function for healthcare, meaning it translates into an amount of available healthcare, which can then be consumed by agents who are sick and require healthcare. And then there's also sick pay in the model because our agents may become ill. And if they become ill, they become temporarily in economically inactive. And in that case, unless they are already retired, they will receive sick pay. Uh, two modifications that are not directly related to the epidemiological model, but that we made anyway, because we thought that they were useful where are that we updated the search and mechanism uh, the search and matching mechanism on the goods markets very slightly. So in the baseline CATS model, the uh, firm customer networks are in a sense purely transitory because they are completely reshuffled in every period. What we've introduced instead now is that every customer in every period visits a certain number of firms to consume but this, this subset of firms that they visit always contains the largest firm in terms of how much they consume that they visited in the previous period. So there is some persistence in the firm customer network, which also means that there are fewer, uh, that, that there, there are slightly fewer frictions on the goods market because there are fewer matching failures. And then uh, the, the last modification that I want to mention is that we introduce an interest rate on deposits. And this is mainly done 
so that if we ever want to do monetary policy experiments in this model, um, we have an uh, the, the, there is an additional feedback channel for monetary policy, which, however, so far we have not made use of, but it's there if we want to. Then, in addition to this economic model that I just described, our framework also includes an epidemiological submodel. And the first important aspect of this model is that it runs at a weekly rather than a monthly frequency. And uh, meaning that in every month, the economic model runs once and the epidemiological submodel runs four times for four periods. Um, and this is done because while from an, from an economic point of view, we felt that uh, the monthly frequency was probably uh, high enough. From an epidemiological perspective within a month, as we saw, especially during the first wave, but also during the second wave of COVID with, with, within, one, within one month, a lot can change with, with, in terms of the epidemiological dynamics. Uh, so we felt it important that the epidemiological model run at a higher frequency such that we can get to a realistic depiction of the epidemiological dynamics. So in the uh, epidemiological sub-model, there is, uh, well, or uh, in, 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 in our model, there exists, in addition to the epidemic disease that I'm going to talk about in a second, there exists, in fact, an endemic and non-lethal disease that is always present, which in every period will randomly infect a small subset of agents in the model. And this is purely done to create a baseline demand on our healthcare system. Um, then coming to the, uh, to, to, to the actual epidemic part. In the model, agents have connections among each other, and we distinguish in the model between permanent workplace and random connections. So we say that every agent has a number of connections which are permanent in the sense that, say, agent 1 and 10 are permanently connected to each other and they meet each other every week. Those might be thought of as close friends or family or whatever. In addition, there are workplace connections, meaning that if you, as an agent, work at a firm, you have a connection to, ev to all other agents who also work at that firm. And thirdly, there are random connections, which we thought of as representing random encounters throughout the week, uh, you know, like acquaintances or encounters during leisure time, shopping, whatever. And these are reshuffled in every period. Then at some point during the simulation, the, we inject a, a small number of agents within this model are exogenously infected with a contagious and potentially lethal disease, which can then spread among this network. And uh, it spreads in the following way. In every period, uh, we look at all the connections that exist in the model and we choose the subset of connections, which involves exactly one agent who is infected with the epidemic disease and one agent who is susceptible. Then from this subset, a fraction of these connections, where this fraction can be thought of as the base transmission rate of the disease, a fraction of these connections will result in a new infection. Once an agent is infected with the epidemic disease, that infection may be a mild case of the disease, in which case it is detected with some probability in every period during which the agent is infected, or the infection may be serious, in which case the infection is detected with certainty. And the probability of having a serious case of the disease increases with the agent's age. All agents, all infected agents whose infection is detected are isolated, the ones that have a serious case of the disease are hospitalized, and those with a serious case may die with a probability, which again is increasing with their age. The hospitalized agents, in this case, both the ones that have the normal endemic disease and the epidemic contagious disease will generate a demand on the healthcare system. So when an agent is, in, is infected with either disease, 
That means they have a certain demand for healthcare and they turn to the healthcare system, which has a certain more or less fixed supply of healthcare that it can provide. And this healthcare is allocated to the agents on a first come first serve basis. And if demand of healthcare, aggregate demand of healthcare, uh, well, no, sorry. So if, if, if the demand of healthcare of an agent exceeds the available aggregate supply, so if, if basically all the healthcare has been used up by some other agents, then their probability of dying will increase if they have the epidemic disease. Um, all agents that are ill and detected, so you know their, their infection has to be detected, otherwise uh, they just keep doing what they do. But if they are detected, they will also become temporarily inactive, regardless of whether or not they are hospitalized, they become temporarily inactive on the labor market and receive a sick pay. And if an infected agent has not died after a certain stochastic number of periods, they will recover. Uh, so this was sort of a very broad overview of the model. Um, moving on to calibration and simulation of the model. So at present, the economic part of the model is calibrated by hand to sort of very roughly try to reproduce moments which we draw from macroeconomic data for the Lombardy region of Italy. And if we look at the results of this calibration exercise, I would say that the fit is kind of broadly acceptable. We are fairly good at reproducing standard deviations uh, of GDP and consumption. Uh, standard deviation of investment is a, is, is a fair bit too high, but uh, overall, it's, I mean, it's not so bad. Also, when we look at uh, the autocorrelations of the main macroeconomic variables and the cross correlations between GDP and the other main macroeconomic variables, it kind of broadly looks okay. Um, so this is sort of the calibrated economic baseline model that is the model without the epidemic disease. And starting from this calibrated economic baseline model, we then simulate three scenarios without economic policy intervention, namely one, which is called the uncontained epidemic scenario in which you inject, the, uh, you inject the, the epidemic disease and then do nothing, meaning you just let it spread. You don't do any lockdowns. And in fact, also the agents themselves do not in any way change their behavior. Uh, then we have an, uh, a scenario which we term endogenous social distancing that I'm going to talk about in a second. And then we have a third scenario which is endogenous social distancing plus a, gov a government mandated lockdown. So the endogenous social distancing scenario, we model as follows. So in the model agent, in, in, in this case, agents in the model, household agents can make a decision to spontaneously, endogenously engage in social distancing, which we sort of model as a binary choice as in the canonical Brock and Holmes model. Um, and there's also, this reference to uh, a paper where, well, this, 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 this is a paper by uh, Yorgos Galanis and, and, some, uh, and some of his co-authors, I think, yes, Corrado di Guilmi is also on it, uh, in, in, in which they model exactly this kind of endogenous choice to socially distance. And in fact, the way that we model in social distancing is, is very close to theirs in particular. We uh, assume that the probability of engaging in social distancing of an agent uh, is increasing in the number of currently detected infections, as well as the share of other agents who also already socially distance. So there's uh, a, an element of social influence in there. And finally, we also assume that there is a, a fixed perceived cost to social distancing, a kind of uh, uh, an inconvenience to socially distancing that must be overcome before you engage in social distancing. And if, if an agent distances, that has uh, three main effects. The first one is that the number of random connections between agents is reduced. 
So the more agents distance, the fewer random connections there are in the model. However, the permanent connections and the workplace connections are basically unchanged from before. Secondly, uh, social distancing will reduce the probability that an infection will result from a contact. So recall that in the epidemic model, we take this subset of connections, which involves exactly one infected and one susceptible individual. Then we take a fraction of those and we say that each of those results in an infection with certainty. Now, if one or both of the agents involved in this connection socially distances, then the connection will result in an, in an infection with a probability that is smaller than one. Um, then and the, the, the third effect of social distancing is that if an, agent's begin, if an agent begins to socially distance, their demand for luxury goods will decline and their demand for basic goods will increase. Uh, turning to the uh, third scenario, which is the lockdown scenario. So in this scenario, we assume that agents may endogenously social distance dep depending um, on the evolution of the epidemic. But in addition, the government may implement a, a, a lockdown. And this lockdown is triggered if cumulative detected infections exceed a certain threshold. And if that is the case, what happens is that a fraction of luxury good firms are closed completely. The rest of the luxury firms com moves completely into smart working, uh, home office working, which means that the number of workplace connections are reduced and also the number of permanent and random connections is reduced by a fixed factor, which you know, we can imagine as the effect of restrictions to you know, whether you can go see your friends, meet your family and so forth. This lockdown also is assumed to lower the per agent's perceived cost of social distancing, meaning that as long as the lockdown is active, uh, agents are more likely to also endogenously socially distance. And it also is associated with an increased effort to detect cases, meaning that from the beginning of the lockdown onwards, the probability of detection increases linearly. And the lockdown ends if newly detected infections per period fall below a certain threshold at some point. If this is the case, if once the lockdown has ended, for all the firms that were previously closed are allowed to reopen, but they will remain in smart working mode for a stochastic number of periods. And the number of connections between agents will slowly return back to its baseline level. And so on, so on this graph, I've sort of summarized um, the epidemiological impacts of these three different scenarios that I've just outlined. And you can see that there are really quite dramatic differences between them. Uh, you can see, well, you can see that both in terms of the number of total defect, uh, infections and detected infections, uh, the lockdown scenario is, well, re results in, 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 in a much smaller number of infections as as one would suspect. Um, but also one interesting aspect is that in the social distancing scenario, you get this sort of cyclical movement in the new infections, which is due to you know, agents socially distancing and then relaxing when the number of infections goes down and then the number of infections goes back up and then they distance again. And so there, there's this sort of cyclical movement in new infections. And uh, the same dynamic can also be uh, observed in, in, the, in the number of fatalities that result from the disease, where again, there is a pretty massive difference between the three different scenarios where the uncontained epidemic leads to, to a much higher number of deaths than either the social distancing or the lockdown scenarios. If we compare the uh, lockdown scenario, which is obviously the closest to, to, to the uh, empirical scenario in the sense that empirically during spring, there was a lockdown in Italy. If we compare this scenario 
um, to the actual infection numbers from uh, from the Lombardy region from February. So this is just for the first wave, meaning from February onwards until I think in this paper we stop around June. You can see that uh, in the lockdown scenario, we are able to match the empirical numbers relatively well. Although one thing to note is that towards the end, uh, the epidemic in our model kind of tends to peter out, whereas, um, of course, empirically, infection numbers kept growing slowly for a while and then, then obviously went back up. So this is, this is something that I'll come back to, in fact, later on. Um, and turning to the economic side, we can here also see that the three scenarios differ quite dramatically in terms of their economic effect. So we can see that the, uh, <clears throat> the lockdown scenario causes a very sharp but also relatively short, extremely deep downturn in GDP for the duration of the lockdown itself, which is just over two months in most of the simulations. So we can see that for this duration, obviously, because a, a, good, a good number of firms are closed in the model, meaning that they, they cannot produce output, increase, uh, output decreases very sharply, but then also bounces back quite quickly once these firms are reopened again. But importantly, it doesn't bounce back immediately to its previous level, but instead to a level that is some that that is uh, quite a fair bit below the baseline, and then uh, and then sort of slowly converges back toward the previous level, and in fact slightly overshoots for a while. Uh, the social distancing scenario, on the other hand, you can see that the uh, economic impact is. Uh, it is, is, is relatively milder. However, it is also more drawn out, meaning uh, it takes a lot longer to recover completely. This is mainly due to the fact that if you only have endogenous social distancing, the epidemic drags out longer. Uh, whereas in this, uh, in this particular paper, the lockdown is quite effective um, at, keeping, at keeping infection numbers under control. And yeah, I mean, the, the, the rest of these three, the, 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 the rest of these four graphs are kind, kind of give a similar picture. You can see that, uh, you know, under the lockdown scenario, government debt as a ratio of GDP goes up quite a lot and then only comes back to its baseline level very, very gradually. Uh, and so forth. One interesting thing, which is also kind of an art, which I think also Herbert showed in the results from his paper, which is kind of an artifact of how the model works, is that in the uncontained epidemic scenario, GDP settles to a permanently lower level. And this is in particular because you have a relatively high number of agents dying, but also uh, because the people who die are mainly pensioners. And uh, <laughs> that means that the state no longer has to pay them a pension at the same time. However, we assume that the tax rate is unchanged, meaning uh, that their death at the end of the day represents a drag on aggregate demand, if you want. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we settle into a, a permanently lower level of GDP, which, well, that's how the model works. But uh, then we can take a look at this graph, which sort of gives, gives a comparative perspective of the epidemiological and economic impacts of, uh, of the three scenarios that we just looked at. So yeah, this basically gives the same information to what we, uh, to, to what we saw before. We can see that the, you know, the, lockdown scenario has the, 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 the most strongly negative impact on GDP, but at the same time avoids a large number of infections that would otherwise take place. Whereas in the uncontained epidemic scenario, you have a very high number of infections, but the economic impact um, is, is, is milder 
however, more drawn out. And the same goes for the uh, social distancing scenario. And so then departing from the lockdown scenario, so taking this as, 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 as our starting point, we then implement uh, a range of policy experiments. The first of those is uh, something which we term a layoff ban, which essentially means that well, you're no longer allowed to fire workers. So uh, the way that works is that firms so the firms in the model, once they stop producing or once their demand falls, they would like to fire the workers that they no longer need. We now implement a policy which says they are no longer allowed to, but at the same time, the state will pay the wage for the workers that they would otherwise fire. Uh, then the next policy experiment that we implement is two different forms of liquidity support to firms. Uh, in the first variant, the state gives liquidity injections to firms which would otherwise become insolvent, meaning those firms that have a liquidity shortfall receive a liquidity injection, which is just sufficient to cover their, liquid, to, to, to cover their liquidity gap, as it were. Uh, whereas in the second variant, we simply make a generalized liquidity injection uh, to all firms in the model, a lump sum, one off. Uh, then the third policy experiment is uh, credit guarantees, which essentially works in the same way as the first variant of the liquidity support policy. So what happens there is that if a firm has a shortfall of liquidity, we assume that it, that, uh, it receives a loan from the banking sector, even if the banking sector would otherwise not want to lend to that firm and the state uh, guarantees that loan, meaning that if the firm subsequently goes bankrupt, the state takes the loss that the bank would otherwise take. Then the fourth policy scenario is called equity support, in which the state for a certain period essentially uh, rescues all the firms that would go bankrupt uh, by giving them an equity injection, which also entails that the state becomes a part owner of these firms and receives a part of the dividend. And then the final experiment that we do is called income support, which is essentially just that for a certain duration, the state makes a transfer payment to all households. In addition to all of the benefits that it already pays in the model, every household receives a certain transfer payment. And when we look at the results of this, we find that in our model, income support is uh, by some margin, the most effective policy in speeding up the post-lockdown recovery. However, a combination of the layoff ban and a one-off generalized liquidity injection to firms are also quite effective. On the other hand, the uh, liquidity support policy, which only helps firms in distress, as well as the credit guarantees, uh, have relatively little effect uh, because they essentially tend to only help firms that are, uh, well, to begin with, the liquidity injections are relatively small because they only make up the, uh, the, uh, the, the liquidity shortfall of those firms. So they are much smaller than the one of generalized liquidity injection of firms, but also, uh, they may not prevent firms from, they, they only prevent firms from becoming illiquid, but not prevent them from becoming bankrupt. Um, and at the same time, they do not incentivize the firms to uh, produce additional output. And then finally, the equity support, it turns out in our model, in fact, may even slow down recovery. Why? Uh, the re I mean, the, the, the reason for that is kind of similar meaning that you artificially by by doing by by essentially injecting equity into any firm that would otherwise go bankrupt and exit the model you essentially artificially keep these firms alive these firms will typically be relatively small relative to the others in the model but at the same time by giving them alive uh, by by keeping them alive uh, you do not 
provide them any you you do not you do not provide any stimulus to make them to make them produce more so they're just kind of around and not do much whereas and this is something i'm going to come back to in the conclusion if the firms go bankrupt and exit the model they are at present and this is something we are working on immediately replaced by new firms which the firms replacing them tend in fact to be larger than the ones that exit and it, i mean this is this is a bit of a problem uh, a, a bit so this result with the equity support is a bit of an artifact of the underlying assumptions of the model which we are not we are not completely happy with um, and that we are currently working on but uh, be that as it may this uh, graph here provides a, a quick overview of the uh, effect of the different policies that I just mentioned in terms of first cumulative output loss and then the average time to recovery. So you can see that uh, especially with the income support and with the layoff ban combined with generalized liquidity support, the cumulative output loss from the lockdown and, and epidemic is much smaller than in the baseline case. Whereas under equity support, we find that uh, the output loss actually may become slightly worse. And the result is kind of similar to time to recovery. Uh, for time to recovery, the equity support policy, in fact, tends to increase the average time to recover to full recovery in months, whereas we have a significant decrease in the case of these two policies. So, sorry, can I ask a yes. question? Sure. Hi, Severin. This is Tiziana. Hi. So, uh, if you go back to the reason you were explaining why you find such a small uh, uh, re impact of the support that you get, you give to firms. I mean, it's not clear to me what. Uh, so, you, you were explaining that this is due to the fact that the ones that go bankrupt are uh, are replaced by firms that become immediately. I mean, I didn't get your, your explanation. Okay, so. Suppose suppose that um, there's a firm in the model that would go bankrupt, but it doesn't because it gets an equity injection. So it stays in the model, but that doesn't mean that it immediately wants to produce more. However, if, if it goes bankrupt and exits the model, then at least according to the bankruptcy mechanism that is in the model right now, it is immediately replaced by a new firm which is initialized such that it wants to produce an amount equal to a trimmed mean of the output of the other firms. Okay, so the problem essentially is in the fact that those I mean, the firms that are receiving yeah. this support not necessarily use, use the support for, uh, to, 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 to produce. Exactly, because um, I mean, just because the firm has more equity doesn't mean that it wants to hire more workers or produce more. If it doesn't expect to, and if, if, if this firm is already very small and was previously close to bankruptcy, uh, the fact that it receives an, an equity injection doesn't mean that it immediately wants to produce more if it doesn't expect to receive more demand for its products. Okay, so it's more like, I mean, it's induced by the fact that in principle, the firm is, is not expecting uh, the demand. So even if it's yes. uh, yes, okay. Yes, uh, exactly. It's a, demand, it's a demand driven effect at the end of the day or not? Yes, in a, I mean, I, 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 would, I would say it's, a, it's an, yes, but I mean, you can, you can say that, yes. Uh, the, the, the fact that Yeah, yes. It, it, yeah, the, the point is that the equity support gives keeps the firms alive, but doesn't incentivize them to produce more, essentially. Okay, and this is due to the fact that they don't expect demand to increase. Yeah, so exactly, that's exactly. So, whereas, whereas if they exit and are replaced, then according to the current bankruptcy mechanism of the model, they are replaced by firms which want to produce, which are initialized with a certain expectation. So it, it, it's, it's an artifact of the 
Okay. Or, or, or the replacement. Is, I mean, this is just a curiosity that uh, this is due to the fact that maybe you are just uh, not discriminating uh, among those firms, uh, among the firms to which you are addressing the support. I mean, you are the, what, I, what I'm saying is that it can be the case that you are addressing the support to firms that indeed, given the, 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 situa the situation of the economy, will not uh, benefit just because of this demand driven effect. Yeah, well, no, this, this, this might be. Yeah, it, 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 it might well be that if you if you instead of offering this support policy uniformly to all firms that okay. need it, if you instead make it more targeted, uh, the, 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 the results might indeed change. Uh, the point that I was trying to make here or that that we that the, 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 the point that we might take from this particular experiment is in fact indeed that uh, rescuing firms without incentivizing them to, to actually produce more um, may be, I mean, may have merit in itself, but it might not help recovery immediately. Okay. Can't I say that it's just due to the fact that you are not targeting, that you would, would need this just to target firms that... Possibly. Uh, that's something we haven't tried. Possibly that might be better, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I add something on, on this point, just to... Sure. Uh, uh, one thing that uh, uh, it has been in the public debate in Italy was indeed uh, a strong push towards injecting equity into firms. Then this, uh, this idea has somehow disappeared from the public debate. So we were trying to see what would be that would have would have been the effect of this uh, of this um, uh, policy measure. However, uh, Severin has correctly pointed out the end result of our way of introducing equity injection is simply to make some firms survive without contributing to restarting the economy. Exactly for the reason that you have correctly pointed out, Tiziana. So there is no change in the expectations of demand. So there is no reason why they should uh, increase production. So they survive. Exactly but they don't contribute to restarting the economy. Targeting exactly. the equity injection would be a, a very interesting point. Indeed, that would mean that you should somehow have uh, an industrial policy combined with uh, an equity injection policy, policy that uh, allows you to pick the winner, so to speak. So those firms that may contribute the most to restarting the economy. Yeah. which could be an interesting uh, uh, new policy experiment, which we didn't try, as a matter of fact. So, yes. But of course, industrial policy is a very controversial issue yes. in the profession and also in the public debate. Indeed. Yeah, so, yeah, I think, yes, I, 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 I would fully agree with, with uh, Domenico's point there. So, I mean, I would not, I'm, I'm not sure how, so, the main, you know, the main point of this uh, that 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 I would take from this exercise is maybe not that uh, equity injections slow down recovery because the reason that they slow down recovery is the bankruptcy is the the replacement mechanism, but the important point is that they do not speed up recovery, um, and this is precisely because the firms that you are keeping alive may not have any incentive to produce more in this sort of blanket application of the equity support. And this kind of brings me uh, quite smoothly to uh, limitations and future work. So what are the current limitations? The first one, which I didn't go into yet, is that this model as it stands is not granular enough to depict some epidemiolog epidemiological dynamics. So one of the main problems that we had right now, we have only 2,500 agents in the model. This is not enough to depict some particular epidemiological dynamics because Lombardy has 10 million inhabitants, meaning that if you want to depict the entire population of Lombardy with just 2,500 agents, I mean, one infection is a very significant, even one single inf infection is a very significant event and even more so one death. This also leads to the problem that the model has considerable difficulty reproducing 
dynamics like the ones that we saw during last summer, where for a quite extended period, we had relatively low infect infection numbers. In this model, if you get to very low infection numbers for an extended period of time, the epidemic indeed, indeed tends to die out. And in, indeed, it seems that this model as it stands, when you implement a lockdown that is strict enough to reproduce the dynamics from the first wave in terms of infection numbers, this lockdown almost invariably kills the disease completely, which is obviously not what we saw empirically. And again, this is related to the fact that there are just not enough agents in the model and that you are not able to depict the, uh, the epidemiological dynamics in, in a granular enough fashion. Then the second point is coming back to Tiziana's comment and uh, Domenico's comment, which is the, the, the bankruptcy mechanism produces some weird results, namely that keeping firms alive not only doesn't speed up the recovery, but actually slows it down because the firms that come in to replace the bankrupt firms actually tend to produce more than the ones that were in the model beforehand. Um, so these are the two major points that we are addressing in a revised version of the model. So we've now constructed a version of the model with some very slight simplifications that allows us to run the model instead with 30,000 agents instead of 2,500. And um, this is a work that we are doing now also with a, a third, uh, with, with another co-author, with uh, Enrico Turco. And uh, this 30K agents version of the model does indeed seem to be better able to uh, reproduce realistic looking epidemiological curves also beyond the first wave. Um, then we also slightly reworked the, epidemiologic, the epidemiological component of the model. In particular, we've gotten rid of the random connections and replaced them with shopping connections, meaning that you are now, uh, you, you now meet a certain number of agents when you go shopping. And then importantly, we have replaced uh, the bankruptcy mechanism uh, by supposing that when a firm goes bankrupt, instead of being immediately replaced by a new one, which is in our view unrealistic, especially if you model economic dynamics at a monthly frequency on the one hand, and on the other hand, in the middle of a lockdown and a pandemic, uh, instead of being immediately replaced, we have an endogenous entry mechanism in which the firm that goes bankrupt is replaced with a certain probability. So there's a probability for a new firm to enter, which is based on the average profitability in the market that the firm wishes to enter. And what do we want to do with this extended version of the model? Um, the first thing we want to do is something that can be done in, in a relatively simple fashion, namely to analyze the effects of variants of the virus and of vaccination. So kind of similar to uh, what the group from Bielefeld has, has done with their model in, in, the, in the most updated version. And then another thing we are thinking about is to extend our analysis to slightly more long run issues, because obviously now, especially in Italy, the debate is moving on uh, more towards the, the long-term implications uh, of the pandemic and also the way uh, in which the, the, uh, the, the, the money from the EU recovery fund should be used. However, in this case, we would probably simply do away with the epidemiological component of the model and instead uh, use a framework in which uh, there's more emphasis on technological change and so forth, which of course right now we do not have in the model at all. And that was all. I think, yeah, I'm slightly over time, but yes, that was okay. all. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, that's great, uh, Severin. Th thanks so much. It was a really great presentation, um, and, and really nice to see uh, like that there was a strong focus on, on policy applications um, um, uh, that you that you showed us. Uh, so as I said, like yeah, we're almost out of time. So maybe we have time for like one or two quick questions. So if you uh, want, then please put it in the chat or raise your hand. And I see that uh, Mauro has a question. So please unmute, unmute yourself and fire away. Yeah. Hi to everybody. Hi, Severin. Thanks very much for the nice presentation. Uh, okay, I just have two comments uh, that uh, may involve the uh, also probably may, probably may use for possible extension. I, I wonder. I mean, one big issue with uh, the COVID was precisely the fact that uh, uh, the supply shock was nested to a demand shock. So I wonder whether firms. Uh, in the, in the model, they, they take into account, uh, they, they decide based on uh, uh, expected demand or not, because this is an important channel, because actually if you have bankruptcy, then you have some workers who lose their, their job, they cannot spend, and this lowers production. And uh, so, um, so in that sense, actually providing equity uh, can help, and also probably can explain why the income support does not is not very effective in your model. So this is the first comment. The second one is whether, I mean, one issue, another issue, important issue is the fact that typically, I mean, uh, the COVID could have also produced some cleansing effects in the sense that uh, uh, those firms that were uh, uh, less productive uh, uh, would have gone out of the market. And uh, but this requires actually taking into account heterogeneous productivity that may evolve over time. So I was wondering whether you are taking this into account or not. And uh, finally, uh, just one point about epidemiological COVID. So I see that you said the lockdown, uh, so the strong lockdown basically uh, kicks out uh, all the epidemics. But uh, in fact, uh, this uh, is, of course, depends on the assumption that everybody, I mean, respects the lockdown, something which, uh, so the lockdown is fully enforced and uh, this is not always the case. So I was wondering whether there could be a way of uh, adding some uh, deviations uh, in the sense of having some noise so that keeps contagion going on, uh, has uh, probably was also the case empirically. I'll mm -hmm. stop there. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Uh, I'll start with the last question, which is, um, so, I mean, in a sense, well, we, well, we, we do assume that we, we do assume that there is a full adherence to the lockdown measures. However, at the same time, there is still this endogenous social distancing component, meaning that an agent may or may not decide to engage in social distancing. So the, 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 mm. okay. agents do behave in different ways, right? Uh, some some have more contacts than others. The reason, I mean, the, the, the reason that the, the epidemic dies out and the, the reason that the epidemic dies out is simply that there are not enough agents in the model. When you get to, mm -hmm. when you get, uh, and that the number of infections is partly stochastic. So when you mm -hmm. get to a point where you have like on average one infection per period, which would be actually what is needed to roughly reproduce the numbers that we saw during the summer in Lombardy, when you extrapolate, you know, what, what, the, how much, how many empirical infections does one infection in our model represent? When you extrapolate that, then during the summer, we would, we, we, we would have to have about one infection per period in our model. Okay. Once you are at this point, because the spread of the disease is partly stochastic, it usually happens that at some point it just dies out by chance. Okay. Um, and this is again, purely because there are not enough agents in the model. Mm -hmm. Once you scale it up enough, you can, you mm -hmm. can reproduce these kinds of dynamics. Okay. Yes. Uh, and whilst at the same time, also producing, reproducing the results of the first lockdown without killing the disease. Okay. <laughs> um, then wait the thing that then there was yes your question about expectations okay so in the model firms produce so the, the production decision is essentially based on on past demand right mm. so on past excess demand or supply so in that sense if if a firm has experienced low demand in the past it will want to produce little 
in the current period. Uh, however, they may also at the same time be constrained by liquidity, by available liquidity. And this is a constraint that can, in fact, be alleviated by uh, liquidity injections, but also by equity injections. Um, however, the, 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 firms, the firms that do go bankrupt in the model tend to be, tend to be indeed ones that uh, that that are already that, that are already expecting to receive very little demand so mm. injecting equity injecting them with equity doesn't make them doesn't in itself make them expect more demand although i mean this is this is again something you could probably play with one thing that we do do which is kind of similar to uh what we in fact do in our covid io model is that once the lockdown is lifted firms take this into account in the sense that the firms that were previously closed don't expect zero demand once the lockdown is over but they expect something uh closer to what they had so to the normal level yeah closer to the normal level because otherwise you get stuck um at the at a level uh, you get stuck for a very long time at a very long level of uh, at a very low level of output and then the final question in terms of uh, productivity and sort of uh, uh, weeding out uh, inefficient firms. Now, this this is something that indeed uh, our model does not really depict in that sense because there, there are no there's a, the, all, all firms are uniform in terms of productivity. Mm, okay. This is this this is partly related to this uh, extension to long run issues that we are currently considering, um, in in which we would focus more. On, on on firm heterogeneity in terms of productivity and so forth. But right now, this is this is a dimension that we don't have. Okay, um, so I see that um, Marco Pangalo has been patient um, with a question, but we're almost out of time. So Marco, if you could be, please, very brief with your question. And that's in the last one. Sure, thanks for the talk, Severin. Uh, um, ju just a quick comment. Uh, I think that the result about the level of GDP being permanently lower is not that crazy. And in fact, uh, when I looked at the first papers back in March, where the, when there were people using CG models to forecast uh, what the pandemic would be like, uh, that was the very standard result. There was this Kibbin, Fernand and McKibbin paper. It was like uh, in the very early days. Uh, and so in the end, I think it makes sense. And, uh, and so I, I think that's a, a feature rather than a bug. The um, co question I had in the slide where you showed the GDP consumption investment and public debt uh, in the various scenarios, I saw that consumption decreased as much in the uh, distancing scenario as in the lockdown scenario. Yes. So that means that you calibrated the fear of infection, so the voluntary reduction in consumption in a way that you would get exactly the same reduction as if you closed down entire sectors. Is that the reason why the two things are the same? Because I would expect that with just the fear of infection, so voluntary social distancing, the drop would be milder. At least that's what we find. We're working on something similar, but... It was just you. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, if you zoom in, you see that the drop is in fact milder, uh, somewhat. Okay. But so it is. I mean, it is not purposely calibrated to to give to produce the same drop in both scenarios. But what does happen is when you socially distance, you reduce your demand for luxury goods and you increase your demand for basic goods. But in percentage terms, your demand for luxury goods decreases more strongly than the one for basic goods increases. This is an assumption that we make. So you essentially, you receive two shocks, one positive shock to basic goods demand, one negative shock to luxury goods demand, where the shock to luxury goods demand is always larger. And this leads, in, in, in this case, the way that we've calibrated it leads, leads to this effect. Interesting, what main, one interesting thing is that uh, you don't see that reproduced closely in GDP, in not immediately, because precisely uh, firms produce based on expected demand on this and this drop in the first instance is unexpected and then in fact you know you bounce back quite quickly so GDP doesn't follow consumption one for one 
Thanks. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I mean, it, it goes back to all the debate about whether it's the virus or the lockdown kid in the economy. I mean, of course, it's the virus uh, in, in the long run, but they would say that at least for the very short lockdown period, uh, if you close down entire sectors, there is a, uh, yeah. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Okay, then, yeah, thanks so much. So that was a great presentation and a great discussion. Um, so, um, yeah, so thanks, Severin, and, and thank you all for participating in the seminar. Um, just at the end, very briefly a quick preview for the next um, seminar on the 25th of March. So the presenter will be Yoshi Kukachka um, from the Institute of um, Economic Studies at Charles University in Prague um, with the title Estimation of Heuristic Switching in Behavioral Macroeconomic Models. So I hope to see you all there as well. And uh, thanks very much again. And yeah, have a good rest of the day. Okay, bye everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank bye. you, Severin. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.